Hello, my friends, this is Dr. Beter. Today is August 25, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 67. Twenty years ago, on August 14, 1961, the world was shocked by the news from the divided city of Berlin. For years East Germans had been flocking to the West by crossing from East to West Berlin. That flood was about to be stopped. A wall was being built to divide the two halves of the city. We watched in utter disbelief as the Berlin Wall was built twenty years ago, but, my friends, we learned very little. Today new walls are being built to contain a people, but the people are asleep and do not see the walls. Once again an entire people are being divided, not by physical walls, but by unseen divisions among their leaders. The country, my friends, is the United States, and the people are you and me. The most important walls of any dictatorship are not those built with hands, but those of the mind and heart. When walls are built that rob a people of information, they become vulnerable, and when walls of hatred shut out the ability to think, a people cease to be free. Slowly but surely, free channels of information in America are being snuffed out in important places. This month on August 7, the Washington Star newspaper died after 128 years of publication. In past AUDIO LETTERS I have frequently quoted the Star for just one reason. It was a far better newspaper than the Washington Post. It was more objective, better written, and in many cases simply more honest. Now Washington, D.C., supposedly the capital of the Western world, is left with only one newspaper, and that one is at times the handmaiden of the government living on government handouts and CIA connections. The Post was not always that way, but today that's all that is left in Washington. In effect, the people have been frozen out. With quietness and stealth, the United States Government is taking on the overtones of two opposing forces at once, Fascism and Bolshevism. The United States Government is torn within by a gigantic power struggle. Which group will win is impossible to predict at this time, but both power factions have one thing in common. They both want to build the walls of dictatorship around you and me. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, The Unexpected Rebirth of an American Gold Standard. Topic No. 2, The Emergence of the Jewish Question in America. And Topic No. 3, The Libyan Dogfight and Hidden Naval War Games. Topic No. 1. The entity President Reagan is fond of saying in speeches, quote, I was a Democrat longer than I have been a Republican." Unquote. Likewise, his past heroes of the White House Oval Office are more often Democrat than Republican, and the hero we hear about most often of all from our actor President is Franklin D. Roosevelt. From the beginning the so-called Reagan Administration has been modeled along lines pioneered by FDR in the 1930s. Like FDR, the present Administration tried to hit the ground running with big changes in Federal policies. Now as then, the Executive Branch of the Government is claiming a public mandate to flatten Congressional opposition like a steamroller, and even though they look different today, the real issues now are once again the same as they were in the 1930s. Those issues are the crumbling economy, approaching war, and the political future of the United States. On the domestic level, 1981 is trembling with the hollow echoes of 1933, and yet there is also one major difference today. In 1933 there was just one major power behind the throne, so to speak, dominating the United States Government. Today in 1981 there are two powerful factions who are challenging each other for governmental control. An enormous power struggle is going on behind closed doors which has afflicted the United States Government with schizophrenia. 
Policy making has turned into a series of skirmishes between these two power groups. As a result, the government zigs and zags this way and that. Top officials, such as the Secretaries of State and Defense, are always in a public tug of war. It all reflects the great power struggle behind closed doors. On one side are the corporate socialists of the Rockefeller Cartel. Back in the days of FDR five decades ago, this was mainly an oil cartel. From there it grew and diversified into a worldwide corporate socialist empire made up of multinational corporations. On the other side of the current power struggle in America are the State Socialists, the Bolsheviks. Like the Rockefeller Cartel, the Bolsheviks have collectivism as their ultimate goal. That is, both groups want to concentrate all wealth and power in a few hands, namely their own. But the Bolsheviks want to do it in a different way. The corporate socialists of the Rockefeller Cartel want their own giant corporations to be the real masters of society. By contrast, the Bolshevik State Socialists want the government to be all-powerful. Through the government, the Bolsheviks want to control the means of production directly through nationalized industries. For decades, from 1917 until very recently, these two collectivist forces had their own separate power bases. Rockefeller Corporate Socialism held sway in America while the State Socialist Bolsheviks controlled the Soviet Union. The two sides came in contact only on an international basis, and under those conditions they operated as secret allies. But over the past five years everything has changed. In 1976 the Bolsheviks were finally pried loose from control of the Kremlin by a determined band of native Russians. Their achievement was the result of six decades of tireless struggle, but it came as a shock both to the Bolsheviks in Russia and to the Rockefeller forces here. The Kremlin's new masters want no part of the international intrigues formerly carried out in tandem with the United States. They also want no part of the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks are being run out of Russia, so they are trying to use the United States as their new power base. This situation has brought the Bolsheviks into direct competition with the Rockefeller Cartel for power over the United States and the world. In late 1977 I reported that a quiet new Bolshevik Revolution was getting underway here in America with the help of the Rockefeller Cartel. It was a desperate attempt by these two groups, formerly international allies, to join forces on the domestic level. At that time both the Rockefellers and the overthrown Bolsheviks from Russia were preoccupied with staving off Russia's new rulers. It was a classic case of that old famous principle, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. What the Rockefeller Cartel has learned instead is that sometimes my enemy's enemy is also my enemy. In early 1979 the Bolsheviks here launched an all-out drive to seize total control away from the Rockefellers. They did not quite succeed as I detailed in past AUDIO letters, but the Rockefeller Cartel was grievously wounded. For more than two years now the behavior of the United States has reflected one basic fact. That is, no one is clearly decisively in charge. Instead the struggle continues. In February 1979 I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 43 that, quote, Soon the inevitable internal conflict here in the United States will be getting underway. On one side there are the corporate socialists of the now headless Rockefeller Cartel. On the other there are the Bolshevik State Socialists." Unquote. My friends, it is this very internal conflict which is now showing itself daily in the behavior of the so-called Reagan Administration. I can now reveal that the Rockefeller Cartel which was almost out for the count two years ago, has made a surprising comeback in strength. As of now, the Bolsheviks here continue to dominate America's foreign policy through their effective control of our military forces. But in the economic and political arenas it is the Rockefeller Cartel that now seems to have the edge. 
My friends, they intend to use that edge in some stunning stratagems intended to rebuild their own power. The power struggle here is starting to turn into a race against time. The Rockefeller Group lacks the power to simply finish off the Bolsheviks, and the reverse is also true. So each faction is gearing up to make the maximum use of its own areas of strength. In this topic and Topic No. 2, I will describe an economic and political one-two punch being prepared by the Rockefeller interests. If these things can be done fast enough, the corporate socialists believe they can blast the Bolsheviks here right out of the water. But as I will describe in Topic No. 3, the Bolsheviks here have no intention of giving the cartel that much time. Before they can be stopped, the Bolsheviks intend to reach their own goal, Nuclear War One. The economic surprise which I am about to make public will come as a shock to most Americans, and yet it has already been foreshadowed by plans which I have previously reported on two occasions. First there was the plan for a gold revaluation publicity stunt which I reported last November 1980 in AUDIO LETTER No. 60. America's alleged gold reserves are listed on Treasury and Federal Reserve balance sheets at the old official price of $42.22 per ounce. As you and I know, they do not in fact have a great deal of the gold which is listed. Those balance sheets are fraudulent, but the plan which I reported last November was for our non-existent gold reserves to be revalued at current market prices. On paper, that would make our gold supplies look ten times bigger in dollar terms at current prices. The whole idea of the plan was to reinforce the false perception that America has a huge gold hoard. A few weeks later the gold revaluation gimmick started to surface. For the first time in many years a major article about the Fort Knox Bullion Depository was published. Through syndication it was published all across the United States as well as many other countries. As I reviewed in AUDIO LETTER No. 61, the article referred throughout only to the market price of the gold. The old official price was totally ignored. The next element in the plan for an economic shock is the one which I first reported last April in AUDIO LETTER No. 63. That item had to do not with gold but with our currency itself. I am referring to the plan to do away with a $100 bill. When I first reported on the plan to eliminate the $100 bill, I received heavy mail about it. People were stunned, but I can report to you that the plan is still on track. In fact, since I first made the plan public in AUDIO LETTER No. 63, at least one bill has been introduced in Congress to do as I described. In AUDIO LETTER No. 63, I also invited you to send mailgrams to the entity President Reagan about our missing gold. Specifically, I urged you to challenge him to look into the discrepancy of 165 million ounces in the Treasury's own figures. Recently I mentioned that I had never heard a single word directly out of the White House in response, and that's still true. However, I have now received copies of the letter which a number of you received. I thank you for sending them, and I feel I should take a moment to comment about them. In every case that I have seen, the response to your mailgram consisted of a letter from the Treasury Department. The letter begins, quote, On behalf of President Reagan, thank you for your letter concerning an audit of the United States gold stock, unquote. The letter then describes a so-called gold audit which is alleged to have been underway since 1975 on the installment plan. Enclosed with the letter is a copy of the latest report on this alleged gold audit. My first comment is that this letter and enclosure in no way answered the question you posed in your mailgrams. That question had to do with a glaring discrepancy of 165 million ounces of gold between two Treasury documents. Nowhere does a Treasury letter even refer to that discrepancy, much less attempt to explain it. So fact number one is, neither the President nor the Treasury Department gave you the courtesy of an answer to your question. Instead, they tried to distract you by talking about something else. That something else, of course, is the alleged continuing audit of the gold. 
Too much could be said about that to go into details here. It's enough to say that the so-called recurring 10-year audit is a totally fraudulent arrangement using a different set of college students each summer for a few weeks' time moving the same stock of junk gold in cell No. 33 back and forth each summer. It is intended to perpetuate the bogus audit which was carried out just after the so-called Gold Inspection Tour of Fort Knox in 1974. If you want to know more details, I refer you to my AUDIO BOOK talking tape recorded in March 1975. Its title is The Fort Knox Gold Scandal and What It Means to You. The point I want to make is that the alleged Reagan Administration is only pretending to look for real cures to our economic problems. They are not listening to you and they will not give a forum to anyone intending to reveal the truth about our gold supplies. Instead, the gold revaluation and $100 bill elimination are to be parts of an economic power play. My friends, our would-be modern-day FDR, the entity President Reagan, is planning to stun the world soon. He will do it by putting America back onto what will appear to be the gold standard. Late last year Congress passed a law requiring that a Federal Commission be created to study the role of gold in our monetary system, but Federal Commissions are never set up in an uncontrolled or open-ended fashion. No surprises are ever wanted or allowed from a Federal Commission. Instead, the Government first decides what conclusions it wants to hear from the Commission. Then the Commission is set up in such a way as to guarantee that the Commission will recommend whatever is desired. That is what has been done with the Federal Gold Commission. Congress decreed last year that it be set up in time to produce its report by October 7 of this year, but after the new Administration took office last January, the Treasury Department kept putting off creation of the Gold Commission. It did not come into being until June 22 and the first meeting of the Federal Gold Commission was not held until just last month on July 16. It was held behind closed doors, with no public observers, no witnesses to testify, and with no minutes kept. As with all Federal Commissions that matter, the Federal Gold Commission is a closed shop. It consists of four Congressmen, three Senators, three members of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in Washington, two White House advisors, and four nominally public members. The Chairman is none other than the Treasury Secretary himself, and to shepherd the group in the desired direction, the Executive Director for the study is another insider, Dr. Anna Schwartz. The small contingent of four so-called public members of the Gold Commission were hand-picked for their known views about gold. Anyone who might have made real waves was carefully excluded from consideration. My friend Mr. Edward Durrell is a prominent example of this. Mr. Durrell offered to serve on the Federal Gold Commission entirely at his own expense. He would have brought with him massive documentation and more than a decade of intensive activity in the realm of our gold reserve. He would have brought true expertise about gold to the Federal Gold Commission. His appointment to the Commission was highly recommended to the alleged Reagan Administration by business leaders and even a few congressmen, but he was firmly rejected because he knows too much. Now that the hand-picked Federal Gold Commission is safely in being, it's supposed to make up quickly for lost time. Congress may be asked to extend the deadline to January 1, 1982, but even that would leave little time for making any serious study of America's monetary future. Fortunately for the Gold Commission members, its conclusions have already been preordained. Even Congressman Ron Paul, a member of the Commission, is to be used, with or without his knowledge, to achieve these ends. Whenever the Federal Gold Commission issues its report, its recommendations are to set the stage for dramatic action by the President. Sometime in early 1982 two things will be done at the same time. One will be to abolish the old official price of gold 
$42.22 per ounce and let the gold price float. The other part of the announcement will be that Congress will be asked to restore gold backing for the dollar. It will be a 20% gold backing, as currently planned, based on the market price of gold. In effect, the dollar and gold will float together in international markets, but for domestic purposes it will be claimed that this is a new gold standard which will restore stability to the dollar. For the first time since 1968 there will be a governor or a break on the supply of dollars. My friends, this will be only a pseudo-gold standard, not a real one. You and I will not be able to walk into a bank and exchange a dollar bill for gold. Likewise, the international gold window, which President Nixon closed ten years ago this month, will not be reopened. The effects of the Reagan pseudo-gold standard will only be temporary, lasting only a year or two, and even that assumes that there is no war in the meantime. And yet it will be a master stroke. For a while it will alter the perception of the dollar. It will appear to be a powerful attack on inflation here in America. That perception will be reinforced by the elimination of the $100 bill on a separate occasion. Even though it will not be a true gold standard, its effect through the marketplace will be dramatic. In relation to the currencies of Europe and Japan, it will seem to make the dollar much more valuable to be bought and held, but don't be fooled. For a while it will seem that the heyday of the so-called almighty dollar has returned once again. My friends, this will be an illusion, because the enormous damage done by inflation over the past ten years will not be undone. It will only be arrested temporarily. For the average working man and woman it may provide at most a temporary breather, no more than that. But for the corporate socialists of the Rockefeller cartel who are engineering it, the pseudo-gold standard will be a bonanza. Huge United States multinational corporations have issued hundreds of millions of dollars of debt instruments in Europe in recent years. They did this when the dollar was weak, with the debt payable in Swiss francs, West German marks, and other currencies which were strong then. But now, as these debts come due, the dollar is being made strong again. This maneuver will allow those debts to be repaid in Europe or elsewhere in currencies which are artificially cheap. In this and other ways it all translates into enormous profits for the Rockefeller multinational corporations. At the same time, the privately owned and controlled Federal Reserve Corporation has been creating record high interest rates in this country. That is creating vast opportunities here for the corporate socialists in two ways. First. Federal Reserve policies are creating a depressionary effect on American industry and business. Basic industries like steel, automobiles, and housing are being forced to lay off workers. Bankruptcies are spreading. Real estate, including farmland, is lost by owners no longer able to pay their debts, and businesses large and small are becoming vulnerable to takeover. It's a time ripe for mergers as the giants swallow up their smaller rivals, merge or die. Besides creating this vulnerability to take over, Federal Reserve policies are also pouring in the money to big member banks to take advantage of the situation. So-called hot money from other countries is flowing into the United States in order to take advantage of the high interest rates here. That money in turn is recycled through the big banks to finance mergers and takeovers by the favored few giants. All of this will be reinforced by the so-called gold standard now being hatched by the corporate socialists. At the same time, the Bolshevik influence within the Federal Reserve and other critical financial areas has been reduced in recent months. The Rockefeller cartel is calling most of the shots at the present time in the economic realm. This is reflected in recent subtle shifts by the Federal Reserve Corporation with regard to struggling banks. 
The Bolsheviks here want to bring down the giant banks which have long been a major source of Rockefeller power, but now that the Federal Reserve Corporation is positioning itself to bail out any big banks endangered by defaults on giant loans to foreign nations. And a few days ago the Fed also announced that it will provide relatively low interest loans to savings and loans that are in trouble. The economic landscape is changing constantly thanks to the infighting between the State Socialist Bolsheviks and the corporate Socialist Rockefeller cartel. There will continue to be surprises which neither I nor anyone else can predict, but as of now it is still the Rockefeller cartel that is primarily getting its way on the economic front in America. Even governmental policies are favoring the cartel as far as economics is concerned. Through the economic route the corporate socialists are working fast to gather power away from the government and into their own hands domestically. They are working feverishly to make a reality of many parts of the secret new Constitution for America which I first made public in 1975. Under their secret new Constitution all industry would be controlled by the so-called authorities made up of the giants of industry. Governmental regulation would be done away with, just as the alleged Reagan Administration is trying to do right now. Small businesses would exist only at the pleasure of the big, subject to licenses limiting their activity. In short, the real economic power of the country would lie in the hands of the corporate socialists. By mergers and other means that is what is taking place right now. My friends, many of the maneuvers now being attempted by the Rockefeller cartel are derived from plans conceived long ago, but they are being executed today in an environment which was not foreseen. Today the corporate socialists of the Rockefeller cartel are in a battle to the death against the Bolsheviks here. The Rockefeller Group are trying to gather economic power to gigantic proportions here very quickly. If they do succeed in their drive for unchallenged economic power here in America, that will be the first big punch against the Bolsheviks by the cartel. It will lead directly into their second blow at the Bolsheviks, which will be in the political arena. Economic power translates into political clout, and if the Rockefeller Group have their way, their political blow to come against the Bolsheviks here will be decisive. As I will describe in Topic No. 2, it is a Sunday punch designed to completely smash Bolshevik power here. If the corporate socialists are successful, America will be torn by internal convulsions far worse than the Civil War. But if they do not succeed, the Bolsheviks believe no one can stop their own plans for domination of America and eventually the world. Topic No. 2 Last month, on Friday, July 17, White House news reporters readied themselves for an announcement. The United States had decided to lift its brief embargo on delivery of F-16 jet fighter bombers to the country which calls itself Israel. Reporters were tipped off that a formal presidential announcement could be expected shortly. The F-16 embargo had been imposed less than six weeks earlier in the wake of Israel's destruction of Iraq's nuclear reactor. The embargo had been so brief as to have no real effect on Israel, but as I detailed last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 66, it was not intended to have any real meaning. Like every other American protest against Israel in the past 33 years, the brief F-16 embargo was only for public consumption. It was a cosmetic move purely for the sake of appearances. By July 17 the fickle mind of the American public had moved on to other things, just as it always does. And so the F-16s were about to be released to Israel. The expected announcement never came that day. Instead there was a new shock from the Middle East. The Israeli Air Force launched all-out bombing raids on civilian targets throughout southern Lebanon. The big bridge over the Litani River was attacked, causing heavy damage and killing many people. The oil pipeline from Saudi Arabia, which all of Lebanon depended upon for gasoline and other fuels, was attacked and blown up. As reported by the BBC, 
but not on American television, Israeli jets bombed every single major town throughout southern Lebanon, and Beirut, poor Beirut, wave after wave of Israeli warplanes thundered over that city which used to be the peaceful pearl of the Middle East. American-made jets with Star of David insignia rained a holocaust of devastation on heavily populated civilian communities. The pilots, many with United States and Israeli dual citizenship, were practicing genocide on the defenseless Lebanese civilians. As the smoke cleared and the moans of anguish faded away, the dimensions of Lebanon's agony horrified the world. In that one raid some 300 Lebanese were killed, 800 more injured, and thousands left homeless. Over a two-week period some 450 died in southern Lebanon. During that same period six Israelis were killed in alleged PLO raids. The White House, which today is a divided house, behaved as if it had been caught off base. Then the embargo on jets to Israel was extended again. The United States pretended to be upset, and Israel pretended to be hurt. Meanwhile there were words of alarm from an unaccustomed direction. Voices who are normally raised in support of Israel were beginning to say in effect, What's going on here? An example was an article in the New York Times for July 23, 1981. It described, quote, widespread distress among American Jews over the increased fighting in the Middle East, including the Israeli bombing of Beirut, unquote. According to the article, one influential Jewish leader condemned the raid as, quote, utterly without redeeming social or strategic value and an absolute violation of community standards." Unquote. Another reportedly worried that actions like these represent a danger to Jews themselves. Others appear bewildered, not sure what to think. One rabbi reportedly summed it up in the words, quote, I still don't think we have all the facts about why Israel did what it did." Unquote. My friends, those words are not far from the truth. The fact is that most Americans, including most American Jews, are not being given the facts. The fact is that today an interlocked military junta is controlling the military actions of both the United States and Israel. America's military policies today are not in the best interests of most Americans. In exactly the same way, Israel's military policies are not in the best interests of most Jews. More than six decades ago a galaxy of prominent patriotic American Jews tried to prevent the creation of a Zionist state in Palestine. The Zionist plan to set up a new nation to be named Israel was, in their view, a cruel and tragic hoax. For one thing, in those days Zionism as a political movement encompassed fewer than 5% of American Jews, and yet the small Zionist minority were claiming to speak for all Jews. Beyond that, the anti-Zionist Jews declared that the promises of the Zionists were not only false promises but prescriptions for tragedy. Israel said the Zionists would be the national home for the Jews, a place of ingathering, of safety, and of rest. In reply, the anti-Zionist Jews showed that the so-called nation of Israel could never live up to Zionist claims. They showed that the nation to be named Israel could never serve as home to more than a small minority of the Jews of the world, and they predicted that the only real accomplishment of Zionist Israel would be never-ending conflict, ever-expanding bloodshed, and tragedy after tragedy. In AUDIO LETTER No. 49, two years ago, I called attention to the prophetic warnings of the anti-Zionist American Jews. Today. Two generations later, very few Americans, Jew or otherwise, are even aware of those warnings. But it is those warnings, not the rosy promises of the Zionists, which are coming true before our eyes. As a place of ingathering for the Jews, the nation which calls itself Israel has been a hopeless failure. Today, 33 years after its founding, the entire population of Jews in Israel remains less than that of New York City alone. From 1969 to 1979 
It's reported that more than 500,000 Jews have left Israel for the United States, and today over 2,500 a month are leaving for the United States. In a nation of only a few million, that is a hemorrhage of catastrophic proportions. And where are all the Zionist promises of a national home where Jews can live in tranquil security? During the past 33 years has any other nation on earth been in conflict with its neighbors more consistently and constantly than Israel? Despite these and other facts, the Zionist image of Israel is the one which has been successfully planted in many minds. Even in major media news reports these days, it is often acknowledged that the Israeli lobby in Washington is a formidable force. Today that power is built upon several foundations. There are four major groupings in the United States which can always be counted upon to support Israel in any situation. One group, of course, are the outright Zionists in America. They always echo the Israeli line, be it right or wrong. Then there are the political conservatives. Even when they may be privately irritated by specific Israeli actions, they remain supportive. They believe that, come what may, Israel is America's bastion against Russia in the Middle East. An American Jewish businessman known for his support of Israel, Mr. Meyer Berger, expressed it this way on the ABC television news program Nightline for July 22, quote, We believe that Israel is an inevitable partner of the United States. It's America's unsinkable carrier in the Middle East, unquote. The third group, a very large group, is that of the fundamentalist Christians. They have been persuaded that this is the real Israel, the reborn Israel of the Bible. This impression is one which has been fostered deliberately by the Zionists from the very beginning. The Khazar roots of modern Israel, which I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 50, are generally unknown to many fundamentalist Christians. Finally, there are politicians in important swing states. Wherever there is a rough balance between Democrats and Republicans, they tend to cancel each other out. That leaves the Zionist minority with the power to swing votes either way. Through money and political organization, they make sure that the politicians who win elections are beholden to them. These four major groups form the acknowledged support for Israel, the Zionists, the Conservatives, the Fundamentalist Christians and beholden politicians. But there is one other group, and it is the most important group of all. That group consists of what the professionals refer to as the Little Jews, the small minority of self-proclaimed Big Jews, that is, the active Zionist leadership here, work on the emotions of all the rest. They do their best to keep all Jews scared, and therefore herded together defensively. The so-called big Jews talk incessantly about the Holocaust, making sure that fears and doubts never die. By means of emotionalism, the small Zionist minority have been able to persuade most Jews that Israel is somehow their cause. It is the Jews of America themselves who most of all are the unwitting victims of Zionism. It is they who are becoming uneasy as they watch Israel throwing off all restraints in warfare. And my friends, it is they, the broad mass of Jews in America, who will soon begin to suffer for the actions of the Zionists. In AUDIO LETTER No. 50 I discussed in detail the relationship between the two political forces known as Zionism and Bolshevism. Both were forged into living entities in the crucible of World War I. Both have common roots which claim to be Jewish but are not, and today both of these political forces use the community of all Jews as a cover for their own activities. The Bolsheviks, with headquarters now in America, work hand in glove with their Zionist brothers who control Israel. Their joint goal is absolute domination of the entire world. Topic No. 1 I discussed the deadly competition now underway here in the United States between the Bolsheviks and the Rockefeller Cartel. Against all odds, 
the Rockefeller Group is succeeding in regaining total control in many economic areas, and the economic power which I discussed in Topic No. 1 is intended to translate quickly into political power. If the Rockefeller interests have their way, America is on the road to Fascism. Their pattern for America is that of Hitler's Germany. That is their alternative which they are now pitting against the drive toward Marxist dictatorship here by the Bolsheviks. In my very first AUDIO LETTER REPORT of June 1975, I described how Adolf Hitler was brought to power in Germany. It was done through the power of giant industries secretly controlled by the Rockefeller Combine. The governmental structure set up by Hitler was Fascism, in which big industry was a privileged partner of government. Today the corporate socialists are working feverishly to repeat that pattern, only more so right here in the United States. This time they intend for their corporate empire to be so powerful as to be beyond control by the government and through their own agents within government they plan to have their own way against the Bolsheviks. Already the so-called Reagan Administration is beginning to show its fascist colors in domestic affairs. Antitrust laws have effectively been shelved. Instead, the United States Attorney General has given a clear green light for all-out corporate mergers and acquisitions. Meanwhile. The Administration is rapidly building the walls to contain us all within the prison which America is to become. Under the guise of immigration control, more and more detention centers are opening up. Likewise, the issue of prison overcrowding has been made into an overnight excuse for an enormous prison building program. When the time comes, they will all be ready for their intended use as concentration camps. The Rockefeller Corporate Socialists here are looking forward to rounding up and silencing their opposition. In doing that, they believe they will ultimately be helped by the Bolsheviks and Zionists themselves. The Rockefellers have always made a practice of studying the psychological profiles of their enemies, and in studying the Bolshevik Zionist mentality they have found an Achilles heel, a fatal weakness. That weakness, my friends, lies in the exercise of power itself. Whenever they have a free reign, the Bolsheviks and Zionists always go too far. Many years ago one of these people confided to a very close friend of mine, quote, We're becoming extremely powerful, so powerful that it is a danger to us. The more power we acquire, the closer we come to the surface. We have left a trail. And as we come closer to the surface, the danger is that someday someone will start following that trail, and yet we cannot stop. We will continue to gather more power, coming ever closer to the surface, until we destroy ourselves with our power." Unquote. The Rockefeller Group believe that it is starting to happen now. In Israel the Zionists are casting off all restraints in warfare creating revulsion worldwide in the process. And here in America the Bolsheviks are riding higher and higher. On all sides the self-proclaimed big Jews are beginning to flaunt their power instead of using it surreptitiously. In the news media, in entertainment, in education, in government, on all sides it is beginning to happen. In all positions of power here in America Jews are becoming conspicuous by their numbers. Up to now this is still a phenomenon which millions of Americans are telling themselves they do not see. We never hesitate to count up the other ethnic groups we see in powerful positions, be they Japanese Americans, Chicanos, Blacks, or whatever, but many Americans are made to feel vaguely anti-Semitic if they dare to count up Jews in the same way. Millions of others do see it, but talk about it only in their parlors or country clubs. But among the Jews themselves a few muffled alarms are beginning to sound here and there. A few are beginning to sense the danger of an anti-Jew backlash from the mushrooming visibility of Jews in powerful places. 
For example, the late Washington Star of May 28 published an article by a top official of the American Jewish Congress. Its title was, Uneasy Eye on the Anti-Semitic Fringe. As one basis of his worry, he pointed out that Jews, quote, hold public office in numbers disproportionate to their percentage in the population." Unquote. My friends, what it comes down to is this. The Bolshevik Zionist elements here in America have acquired so much power that they are starting to go too far. They are beginning to surface in spite of themselves, and the Rockefeller Cartel intends to use this mistake to destroy them. The present Administration will be forced to turn increasingly fascist on the domestic front, and as the echoes of Adolf Hitler grow louder and louder, there will be a rebirth of what used to be called the Jewish question. It all brings back memories of a day in Detroit 1943, my friends. I was in charge of sending and receiving cryptographic messages for the late Colonel Charles King, a protege of General Hap Arnold. One day a family of Jewish friends of mine invited me to their home. It was a Jewish holiday, and I was to share their holiday dinner with them. They were a family of refugees from Germany, and I was fascinated to hear about their experiences. Finally I asked, Why did the German Government go after the Jews? The man looked at me and then looked down at his plate as he answered. There was pain in his voice as he said quietly, I was only a little Jew in business. I was a good Jew. Lots of us were. But it was the big Jews who got us in all this trouble. They just went too far. What do you mean they went too far? I asked. And he said, They had taken over all the reins of power in Germany. There was nothing they did not control. So now the good apples have to suffer with the bad. Then he added, You know, it is several years now since I came to America. In all that time you are the first person who ever asked me why the German Government went after the Jews. So now you know why. Topic No. 3 A few days ago, on August 17, reporters were called together for an announcement by Secretary of State Alexander Haig. He announced that the United States was lifting its embargo on all war planes for that country called Israel. It was a green light for 14 F-16s and two F-15s to be sent to Israel without further delay. It was only one month to the day after the Israeli bombing of Beirut. Lebanon is still reeling from that disaster. In percentage terms, 300 dead in tiny Lebanon is equivalent to 24,000 dead in the United States. Had a disaster claimed that many lives here in a short month ago, it would still be the only thing that mattered to countless Americans. But it happened in Lebanon, not America, and so it created hardly a ripple when the United States told Israel, in effect, here are some more planes so you can do it again. In releasing the war planes, the United States did not even express an opinion about whether Israel's use of the planes is proper. In answer to a reporter's question, Haig said that the causes of the embargo had been adequately resolved, but those empty words can never raise the dead in Lebanon nor silence the sobs of those who mourn for them. The release of the war planes to Israel this month is just a continuation of the pattern I discussed last month. The interlocked military juntas of the United States and Israel are in a hurry. They have a hammerlock on military affairs and they are using it to the hilt. They are pressing forward toward their goal of thermonuclear war between the United States and Russia as fast as they can. If they can succeed soon enough, they will cut short the stratagems of the Rockefeller Cartel which I described in Topics 1 and 2. Events themselves are showing how great is the rush to prepare for war. On August 17 the American warplanes were released to Israel. The very next day, late on August 18, United States time, American warplanes were making new headlines. A pair of Libyan Su-22 jets were lured into a brief dogfight with American F-14s. The Su-22s are primarily ground support aircraft. 
They are no match for air superiority fighters like the F-14. The dogfight was over almost as soon as it began. Both Libyan jets were shot down, crashing into the sea in the Gulf of Sidra. The United States has trumpeted loudly about the success of this air combat. Supposedly it is to tell the world that we mean business, but in many capitals from Europe to the Persian Gulf the message is being read in other ways. In Europe many leaders are nervously saying that Uncle Sam is behaving like a trigger-happy cowboy, and six oil exporting nations of the Persian Gulf are saying that this proves America has no intention of dealing fairly with the Arabs. By shooting down Libyan jets in an artificial confrontation, the United States is also shooting down any new peace prospects for the Middle East. Beyond that, my friends, the Libyan dogfight episode was also staged for more obscure purposes of military deception. Right now stories about the Libyan dogfight are being constantly rehashed to keep our attention on the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, the real action is taking place elsewhere. Even the stories you have heard about the dogfight itself are part of a gigantic naval shell game. The pilots who shot down the Libyan jets are not the ones identified publicly by the Pentagon, and, my friends, the planes which shot down the Libyan jets did not come from the USS Nimitz. While all eyes are on the Mediterranean, the real naval action is taking place to the north and west. On July 14, the largest Allied naval war game since World War II got underway. These exercises involve 13 nations, 120,000 troops, 250 ships, and more than 1,000 aircraft. This tremendous exercise, called Ocean Venture 81, is to continue until the end of October. It will include air assaults, anti-submarine warfare, bombing raids, even mock battles between aircraft carrier battle groups. Most important of all, many of these war games will intrude into areas traditionally considered to be in Russia's sphere of operation. These massive exercises, my friends, will include not only the North Atlantic but the Baltic and Norwegian seas. The naval war games now underway in the Atlantic are built around America's new belligerent strategy against Russia. That strategy was spelled out in an interview by the Chicago Sun-Times two months ago on Sunday, June 21. The person interviewed was the Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, Jr. Lehman spelled out America's increasing dependence upon aircraft carriers. To make use of those carriers, the article describes the Lehman Naval Strategy as, quote, an offensive one." Unquote. Lehman says that our Navy should be able and ready to bottle up the Russian Navy in such places as, quote, the Sea of Japan, Barents Sea, and other coastal waters." Unquote. Lehman also gives prominent attention to, quoting the article again, protecting NATO's northern flank in the Norwegian Sea. Unquote. My friends, those are the areas into which the massive Allied exercises are scheduled to intrude. It is a radical departure from past American naval policy. In the words of John Paul Jones, it is deliberately sailing in harm's way." Quote, unquote. This is exactly the belligerent new American naval policy which I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 65 two months ago. My friends, the Bolsheviks here are working faster and faster on more and more fronts to prepare for war. Two weeks ago it was announced that America will start assembling its neutron bombs. That announcement is far behind the reality because they have been in production secretly for many months. The only real purpose of the neutron bomb announcement was political. It's just another way for the Administration to show off the chip on its shoulder. Like shooting down a pair of Libyan jets, it's a way of saying we are ready and eager for war. Most Americans would disagree if we were told the truth, but we are not told the truth, and so we continue down the path to war. Now the way is being paved to bring back the draft. Draft registration is already in effect, and now it is being given teeth by publicizing Federal prosecution of those who do not register. 
Beyond that, the government is dusting off the old Bolshevik gimmick of posting public sign-up notices. The idea is to create resentment among those who have registered against those who have not. The net result? Get neighbors to spy on neighbors. Meanwhile, we are being told that the manpower problem is the worst one facing the military. At the same time, we are seeing falsified public opinion polls which say that more and more Americans now favor the draft. Under a declaration of a national emergency, it will soon return. It remains to be seen who will win the hidden struggle between the Rockefeller Cartel and the Bolsheviks here. Only one thing is clear. Regardless of which one wins, my friends, you and I lose. Now it's time for my last minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I have tried to alert you to the hidden power struggle for control of the United States. On one side are the corporate socialists of the Rockefeller Cartel, the Fascists. They are trying to gather power away from the government by economic means. Then using that power they intend to use the old Jewish question, so-called, to throw a political knockout punch at their Bolshevik rivals. On the other side, the State Socialist Bolsheviks are using their control of America's military as their key weapon. They have already declared war against Russia, and now they are trying to drag America into that war, a thermonuclear war. They are trying to do it too fast to be stopped by the maneuverings of the Rockefeller Cartel. Caught in the middle is the double-minded Reagan Administration. The White House is a house divided against itself, first pulled this way, then that way, by the conflicting forces behind closed doors. Neither the Fascists nor the Bolsheviks in our country can save you. Only you can save yourself with the help of our Lord Jesus Christ. He taught us long ago that a house divided against itself cannot stand. The collapse, when it comes, will be awesome indeed. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.